Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, so first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to participate to, to this school. I learned that already that I should not walk with Mark and Christina in the morning before giving the talk. So this, at least I learned that here. And um, okay, so in this set of two lectures, I would like to talk about two different subjects. Um, of course, they are related. And basically, uh, I'm going to tell you about groups of particles that move together. And these particles are going to be uh, passive and driven today and uh, active and self-propelled uh, next um, for the next lecture, which is supposed to be on the next on the Thursday. Okay, so indeed today, I would like to talk about the traffic dynamics of. Uh, do, do, do you have a yeah, pointer? Yeah. Okay, do you have one? Yeah. Uh, the traffic of uh, particles that are cruising in the fluidic uh, networks, and on uh, Tuesday, uh, I will try to give you a simple picture uh, to account for the emergence. Okay, to account for the emergence of. Uh, blocking patterns in populations of uh, self-propelled particles. Okay, but for today, I'm just going to consider uh, pa passive particles that traffic in confined geometry. So to give you first some context, um, I'm sure you are, that you are all aware that a number of industrial and natural processes uh, involve the transport of particles in uh, confined fluidic geometry. So the most obvious example is probably uh, the filtration process where you want to separate or to um, sort particles according to their size by flowing them uh, through a porous uh, network. And another uh, simple instance is given by the traffic of the blood cells in the uh, micro uh, capillaries. So this is a superimposition of pictures of a red blood cell that, I was, that has to make a decision where it's either going to take this microcapillary or this one. So there is this uh, trafficking uh, problem here that you, you can see at the uh, single cell level. At a completely different scale, uh, the understanding and uh, handling the trafficking of small particles in a random network is of <coughs> paramount importance in uh, the NNT oil recovery process. So basically, you know, if you are now uh, working for a oil company, you cannot just take a shovel, you know, dig some uh, hole in the, in the ground and wait for the, the oil just to, uh, just, you cannot just take a bucket and extract the oil like, like, like that. It used to work uh, 100 and probably 100 years ago, but now what you have to do is first to drill a primary well and then secondary well, and what you do is you inject here typically a uh, fluid that is not miscible with oil, either uh, carbon dioxide or water, and you use this fluid to push okay, the oil out of the primary well. And I'm sure that you'll notice that the price of oil has increased like crazy over the last few years, and this means that the oil companies can now not only use water, but water plus chemical additives that are pretty expensive to improve the, the yield of the recovery process. And as, especially when they use those additives, and what happens is that they form emulsions in situ inside the well. And of course, what they want to do is really to extract all these tiny droplets that have been formed inside the, um, the rocks. And then they have, of course, to deal with this uh, traffic problem through a gigantic structure. OK. So, uh, so far I've talked about transport through complex networks, but you've got also many applications where the confinement is uh, much simpler. Uh, typically, uh, the typical situation is the one of a thin film, okay, on which you want to flow a particle laden uh, fluid. And I'm just going to show you uh, one example that I find particularly beautiful, and uh, this example is uh, just the Cosmetic, given by cosmetics, so in all those cosmetic products, um, lipstick, gloss, uh, eyeliner, and this, uh, I don't know if the name paint, I don't know what I should call that. Nail polish, right. Um, 
what you want to do basically is to apply the liquid with a lot of pigments that, and the pigments are quite rare to give the appropriate uh, uh, optical property to the material that you want to apply. And of course here you don't want for instance to form clusters, you don't want to apply a gloss well, that would be shiny here and opaque here. You want it to be uniform and so to control the transport of the particles in, in this thin film. And in this, uh, and in this slide, okay, this is an example of transporting thin film. We, the film here is confined by rigid walls and then free surface, but you can also have situations where you have really films <coughs> confined rigidly by two walls. And of course, this concerns a lot of microfluidic applications, especially the ones involved with in, uh, droplet transport, where by design, I would say, the uh, thickness of the channels that you are using to form and to handle the droplets uh, compare with the size uh, of, the, of the particles that you form and uh, that you are dealing with. Okay, so um, in fact, today uh, I don't really want to uh, describe in great detail one of those uh, examples, but rather to show you that confinement induces uh, interactions between the particles that are non-trivial and I'm going to try to show you that uh, from the understanding of those interactions you can actually understand generic transport features at the uh, large scale uh, level at least. Okay, so in fact I'm going to use slides uh, in the beginning of the talk and then I'll switch probably to the blackboard so I thought that I, it would look like a lecture, and as I'm listening to myself, I realize that it sounds like a talk. So please interrupt a lot. Okay, and we can, okay, let's do this. Let me, let me tell you a story. The, the, the first time that I met uh, Christina and Mark and Vincenzo, who is not here, and he was alive yesterday night, so okay, don't worry, he's yeah. not here. Uh, it was uh, 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what time? Um, okay, no, you don't want to know. Uh, it was 15 years ago, actually. I was a PhD student. And uh, it was in Boulder, and there was this summer school, and a contest was organized. I don't know who organized it. I don't remember who organized the contest. It was a, a question contest. So every week, uh, at the end of the week, before the uh, Friday barbecue, uh, 14 years ago. <laughs> uh, before the barbecue, the students who would have asked the most questions during the week would have had, a, I don't know, some kind of a medal or something like this. So I don't have a medal, but I can pay a beer. Or to a white, I can even give the personal phone number of William Irvine uh, to the students that would ask <laughs> Uh, more questions uh, today, okay? And we, we can even extend the contest to postdocs and let's say that we'll uh, try to, okay, let's do this like that. We try to, mark to, to, to okay, the, the number that we'll try to maximize is the number of questions minus the number of years after your PhD defense, okay? Okay, so you, <laughs> 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 okay, so let's do this. I, I pay a beer to the person who has the, some more questions. Okay, so please interrupt. Uh, so in all the, okay, let's begin with the, the traffic, the traffic problem. So in all the examples that I've uh, shown you so far, what is important to notice is that the size of the particles that you want to transport actually compare to the distance between the walls of the fluidic channels or between the, or the size of the object compares to, um, with the distance between the obstacles okay, that form this uh, disordered structure. So, basically, when a, a particle is here in this channel, it clogs the channel. Okay? Not permanently, it can be objective, but locally, it changes the, the transport pro property inside the channel. And this is the thing that makes the problem interesting, at least to me. And a simplified view of the problem is the following. You can think about a fluidic network as a, just a bunch of pipes. And if a particle lies in the channel, it means that it locally increases the hydrodynamic resistance of this pipe. Okay? 
And that's exactly the same, and you are actually dealing with exactly the same problem as um, an electric network in which you could locally increase the resistance of a wire. So let's say that I'm, I could pick, for instance, today a random wire in the building, and I could try to increase the resistance of the wire just by cutting it, for instance. And even though the modification of the resistance would be local, I could induce a global shutdown of the network. And here they're the same for uh, hydrodynamics. If you locally change the hydrodynamic resistance of one channel, you actually induce a change in the flow in principle at the entire uh, network level, okay? which makes the, the problem non-local um, and non-linear. So the velocity of a particle inside a channel is in principle a function of the position of all the particles Okay, that are traffic in, inside the network. Okay, so this is obviously non-local. That's also non-linear in a sense that if you want to look at what is the current uh, at a given position, this current uh, will be uh, proportional to the, to the local fluid velocity, which itself will be a function of the density and of all of the gradients of the Laplacian of the density field in, in this system. So that's non-linear uh, in, in that sense. Okay, so from an experimental perspective now, uh, to say that I'm an experimentalist, uh, microfluidics is super useful to uh, address this uh, type of problem. So you cannot see here quite well, I think, but here uh, I made a microfluidic uh, network that actually reproduces the map, the street map of Paris. So you cannot see it here, this is a zoom in the Champs-Élysées, okay? And what you see here are just droplets that are pushed and that traffic in this rond-point des Champs-Élysées. This is the Champs-Élysées Avenue. All the fancy shops are there. The clubs are here, okay? And obviously that's uh, quite complex to describe. So today we would rather like to focus on Manhattan, okay? So basically a square network, okay? with only one inlet, one outlet. And what you see again is a bunch of uh, particles, which are here water, droplets, plus some macaroon dye, uh, that are advected by some oil that you cannot see. Okay, and I'm gonna use this experiment as a tutorial example too. Okay, uh, so you have one preferred, okay. Okay, let's, let me first tell you uh, something. Of course, I'm gonna tell you about uh, traffic of droplets rather than, than about the traffic of solid particles just because I didn't want to be killed my, my PhD student at the time. You really want to do, if you do an experiment, you really want to avoid permanent clogging. Otherwise you would have to just to throw away your setup every time that you permanently clog the device. So here you have emitting droplets so that if you clog seriously one part of the device, you can just increase the pressure, rinse it, start over the experiment, etc. And Jean showed you that actually producing monodispersed droplets in micro or milli uh, fluidic uh, setups is probably the most simple thing that you can think about. You just uh, need two inlets, one water inlet, one oil inlet, for instance. And if your channel is hydro or big, you would just form spontaneously a perfectly monodispersed a set of uh, per, um, perfectly monodispersed uh, internal of droplets. Okay, but the problem here is if you want to do a control experiment, uh, you only have two control parameters, and yet you want to control three quantities. The size of the droplet, of course, which I told you was important, but also the velocity of the droplet and the injection rate, right? So you need at least one extra uh, control parameter. And to do this, uh, okay, what we did, and I'm just ad advertising for this type of uh, uh, setup, not because that's very important for the physics, but you might find it useful if you want to devise an experiment yourself. So we use a valve basically to make the droplets. So that's a valve that's made with silicon. If you want to, the, the, the way we, we made it is not really important. Actually now you can just buy those valves. There's a website, you, you can pay online, say, okay, I want, you, know, you send a drawing the design of your valve and a couple of days after you get a bunch of them. And 
And so basically the idea is that here you inject water, here you inject oil, and here you have a small valve, right? So the, 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 the typical, the diameter of the channel is probably around, I don't know, 100 microns, something like this. And here, when you push here on this inlet, you can see maybe that you can close and open the valve. Okay. So every time that the valve is open, you inject some red fluid, and when you close, you just have the transparent flu fluid that pushes this water slug. Okay, so by doing this, you can control independently, of course, the velocity, which is set here by the flow rate of this constant fluid, the size, which is set by the opening time, and the injection rate, with, which is set here by the uh, opening and closing period. So that's pretty cool, especially if you feel uh, lonely in the lab, because you can computer control the device and you can just talk to your microfluidic device. So this one says hello, hello, here indeed. They're saying hello to me, hello Dennis. Okay, so that's obviously useless, uh, except that it shows you that you can really achieve a great control over those parameters. So, and I'm gonna show you some results with a, a, bo a quite boring uh, injection sequence, it's just periodic. So the only control parameter that I'm gonna vary, uh, one <coughs> that we vary, is the injection rate, the droplet current that we inject inside the system. Okay, the, the, the whole point here is that I said this before, is I would like to show you first that you can learn a lot about a physical process only looking at experimental results and not referring to any theory. So I'm gonna show you a lot of experimental results and deduce the only theoretical question that we have to answer to understand the traffic dynamics. So there will be some equation for the person that are interested only in theory, but uh, probably in 15 minutes from now only. Okay, let, so let me show you uh, what the result of the experiments when we increase this droplet curve. For, so for small currents, uh, of course, surprise, surprise, the droplets are just following the shortest path that connect the inlet to the outlet. Okay, simple track. Then, above a critical current value, what you can see here is that somehow a traffic jam forms and droplets are taking side lanes to exit the device. If you further increase the current, the number of droplets that are exploring the side lanes increases, increases, and eventually the entire uh, possible, uh, the, all the, po the possible paths are explored uh, by the advective particles. So now more quantitatively, here what you see is the density profile of the droplets along the central lane, okay? So basically apart from some, if you neglect this uh, geometrical uh, effect that might <coughs> happen here, due to your fluid incompressibility, I don't want to comment about this, you can see that basically the density profile is flat. Okay, so we inject given period and all the droplets okay, cruise along the device at a constant velocity, the density uh, is uniform uh, along the path, good. Except when the injection rate in this case ex exceeded 0.7 hertz, and as you can see here on this curve, we got a huge overshoot of the density at the entrance, that's basically a traffic jam, okay, that occurred here, and that resulted in the invasion of the network. Okay, so now if I look, sorry, not at the, what's that? That's steady state measurement, absolutely. So the rate of this will go on the inlet, will go out the It must be, okay, with the flux. Has to be the same. Whatever the viscosity ratio. You don't, you don't measure the gas. No. Still the no. But, uh, yeah, that's typ typically you would think about a bubble because a bubble has a very low viscosity. So if you look at the effective fluid, you think that it would be basically the, the mean between the two viscosities, weighted by the volume or something like that. But no. Exactly. That as you, you confine the fluid a lot between the droplet and the walls. Okay, and you get these so-called Bretton flows right. that dissipate a lot. Uh, 
no, because the world is not, uh, okay, no, because what, what is comes, <laughs> no, that's right, but you have to uh, have the zero stress condition at the surface of the droplet, okay, and this basically tells you that the flow between the wall and the surface of the droplet is a quasar flow, because you have, If you put a swimmer, what you, what, you, what you're saying is that? I could make, I could make a droplet that certainly will flow through, uh -huh. which reduces the resistance. Of course, if you, if you use a swimmer. Yeah, but now no, no, if you make it passive, there is absolutely no way that you can reduce the dissipation. But, we, but of course, with a swimmer, in, yeah, maybe I'll show you a, a plot tomorrow that confirms that with uh, active particles, you can reduce the viscosity. Okay. So now let me just show you a, a result which is actually uh, simpler than this one uh, to understand. I'm going to show you the variation of the total number of particles along the lane, okay, the average density if you wish, with, uh, as a function, uh, so the variation of this quantity as a function of the current. So basically the integral of this curve plotted as a function of the current. So this is it. So this is, okay, this is the density. This is the density of droplets that increases in the central lane when we increase the current, okay? And at some point here, at this critical current, the density reduces and plateaus, which is corresponding exactly to the point where the network is being uh, explored, uh, is being invaded. But what is remarkable here is first, that the number of droplets, or the density, mean density of droplets does not increase linearly with the injection rate. If you double the injection frequency, you do not double the number of particles along the central line. In addition, you can see that the invasion occurs only when the density, uh, uh, already when the density reaches 0.7. Okay, one is close packing. So you have plenty of space okay, to put additional droplets at the moment where the network uh, is invaded. Okay, so this shows obviously that hydrodynamic interaction okay, dictate the dynamics of the droplet at the onset of the network invasion. Yeah? So this is the average density everywhere along the Absolutely. But so they use the same thing to say what is the density for the central line along the line? So again, that's a good point. Below the critical density, I showed you that the density is uniform. And then you increase the current by you know, 1%, and all of a sudden, boom, you don't have this nice uniform distribution, okay? Even though you could have fitted much more droplet uniformly in the channel. Okay, so one, case, one, uh, one question minus how many? PhD, you, you are a PhD student? So it's that one question, and Paul, that's one question minus <laughs> <laughs> maybe 10, let's say. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Hi, Vincent. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> so the, let me give you an uh, additional evidence uh, of the existence of, of strong hydronomic interaction between the droplets. Here, I plotted the uh, variations of the droplet velocity normalized by the velocity of a single droplet uh, cruising uh, through the channel uh, as a function of the uh, density, but only in the trivial uh, regime where the droplets are uniformly distributed. So you can see that the higher the uh, density, the smaller the velocity. And again, the droplets are really are not touching each other. So this proves again that hydrodynamic interactions are taking place uh, in the system. So the question is basically, oh, where is it? Okay. why are one dimensional traffic flows unstable? How can we understand it? Okay. So before going into the details of the 
theory of uh, atomic interactions, I would like to keep on showing you experiments and show you that we can actually under understand much more about it only look by looking at the data. So if the thing a system is unstable, it means that if you just it just means that by, by definition, if you apply a small perturbation or let's say a, a perturbation of a given amplitude, this perturbation would be uh, amplified and yield to uh, the exploration of an oversteady state, which in our case would be the invasion of the network. So what we did is this. Okay, let me show you a movie, but I'm sure that you won't see anything on the movie. So what we did yeah, here, we increased the injection rate <coughs> for a short period of time. So it's just like adding extra droplets, okay, within the given period of time. And we looked, okay, at the propagation, the amplification, or the relaxation of these density plots. And what you do not see on this movie, because will be video project of the frame rate. I should fix this, but I did not do that uh, yesterday. So just look at the, at the scale picture. Uh, what you can see is that the density perturbation, per perturbation is actually damped. This density uh, excitation actually spreads and propagates, but you don't have any uh, amplification, okay? You do not induce a permanent jam by adding more particles. And this is the case regardless of the amplitude of the perturbation and regardless of the value of the average uh, density. Okay, yeah. The blue dots, pardon? The post, right. I tell you that in the second part of the talk. Okay, so basically you would observe exactly the same thing. Okay, bottom line, you would observe exactly the same thing provided that the posts are regularly spaced. <coughs> okay, so this is, this is the evolution of the density uh, field as a function of time, so this is our initial pulse. Okay, so at the time we had very bad pressure controllers, so when we wanted to reduce the pressure, we had first to increase it. That's crazy, but that's the way it is. So the initial condition is a bump and a small a localized decrease of the density. And as you can see, this bump widen and this one also uh, widen and the amplitude here of the perturbation reduces over time. Okay, so you damp the excitation. So this, we what's up? Pushing this with, with a speed. We are pushing at a constant speed, but here, no, again, I know what you're thinking about. We are not doing uh, a piston. no a piston experiment. It's not like we are increasing the current from one from zero to uh, let's say from one to two. It, the, the, okay, what we do is this. So this is time. This is the injection current, the number of current per unit time, and what we do is this. Okay, that that we we wanted to do is what we did is. This. Okay, so now what you see here is a resulting uh, density profile, uh, which is something like, I've got to do it properly. Okay, this, how does it work? Um, yes, this is probably this. I'll show this in a moment. I'll show you this in a moment. Pardon? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Thanks, 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 thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's better. Okay. Uh, good. And this is a spatial temporal plot. So the color codes for the local densities. This is time. This is the position along the channel. And as you can see here, this front and this one propagate steadily. Okay. Along the central lane. And indeed, the width of the excitation uh, increases uh, over time, meaning uh, here, yeah, over time. Okay, good, perfect. So then we can be, uh, you can be also more quantitative. You can see, so this is the uh, uh, plot that I showed you before. This is a decrease of the droplet velocity, okay? The Lagrangian is the droplet velocity as a function of the mean uh, droplet fraction. And this is a velocity 
that you measure from the slope here of the spatial interval diagram, the velocity of the wave, as a function of the local uh, density, okay? the density which is averaged over this gray uh, region. So both quantities vary uh, linearly with the fraction, except that the slope of this curve is one half of the slope of this one. And this can be the different, okay, let's say that this uh, steady propagation of a sharp form can be actually very easily explained simply by the decrease of the droplet velocity as the fraction is increased. So let's say that this is the initial perturbation that you apply. The droplets that are bare are going to move uh, at a velocity which is smaller than the droplets that are bare and bare just because the density is locally higher, right? So, after a while, the, those droplets are going to catch up with, with, with this one, boom, and form a sharp form. Obviously, you can not have a, a, a density which, which has two values, okay? And this is exactly what you see here, and this is what is called a shock wave. Okay, that's exactly the same mechanism which is responsible for the uh, wave-breaking um, phenomena that you can nicely observe in uh, Ipanema or in and the one half, I'm coming to this right now. Thanks, Vincenzo. <laughs> What's up? Yep. So, so this is density. Uh, pardon? What? That's a rare refraction shock. Okay. So this let me do it on the board, it will look more look like a lecture. And I, I'm sure I will make it right because it's just it's written just over there. And you can actually show that that's indeed a rare refraction shock, and the, 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 the dynamics of the pulse is ruled by the so-called Burgers equation, and I can show this uh, to you very easily. So here what you want to describe is the evolution of the density field. Okay, so basically the density at a given position at a given time. And the only thing that you have to describe the evolution of this field is just mass conservation. Okay. No. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, that's mass conservation. Okay. In your physicist toolbox, you don't have any other tool to describe the evolution of this quantity. And mass, conservations, mass conservation is just saying that the time derivative of the density plus current flux is zero, okay? And the current is simply given here by the product of the velocity by the density. Good? That's very simple. Business as usual in physics, when you, you have a conservation level, and when you look only at a, at a system at a macroscopic level, then you need a phenomenological law to complement the conservation one. Okay, so for instance, to uh, derive the diffusion equation, you have to say that the current is actually uh, the uh, the, the proportional to a gradient of, uh, of the density here. That's much that we, we don't have uh, a thick law or any theoretical result. We just have this <coughs> experiment that tells us that in our case, the current okay, varies linearly with the local density. Uh, sorry, the velocity. So the velocity is just proportional to one minus phi, let's say phi, I call it, did I call it phi, phi c, or two, and to make it look like a, a velocity, I can put the velocity of the fluid here, and I can put here mobility coefficient, which would here, if, I, if phi goes to zero, I'm looking at, on just at the velocity of a single droplet that is <coughs> proportional to the fluid velocity, up to a mobility coefficient, which is a constant here, as the okay, which is a constant here. Good. So if now you plug this and that into this conservation, uh, this observation into the conservation equation, you exactly end up with what? With this Burgers equation, at least in the frame moving at the speed of an isolated droplet. Okay, if you put this 
here you have the product of phi, phi phi, differentiate that phi dx phi. Okay, that's very simple. That's a Burgess uh, equation which has been studied to death by many applied mathematicians, physicists, <coughs> and which indeed describes very well with rare repetition shocks. As it turns out, you can easily show that the speed of the shock is one half of the density difference between this point and this point. Okay, and as requested by Vincenzo, <laughs> I'm gonna show you how you can understand this. I'm gonna show you this maybe in a slightly uh, simpler uh, setup just to make the math, uh, yeah. This one? Yeah. That's just an observation at the moment. It could be five, five, two, five, it could, exactly, it's, it could be exponential minus five. At the moment, we don't know. Okay. And I will show you then why, how you can predict this, but at the moment, that's just an experimental observation. Okay, let's say I'm uh, Fourier, I just look at the transport of the heat, and I notice that the flux is proportional to the gradient. In my case, that's this, not that. So for the one half, that's very simple to show that th this type of equations, uh, equation gives you shocks that pro uh, propagate at the, at, uh, at the speed which is given by this. Uh, also, a speed is missing here that's uh, proportional to the jump, of course. That's not equal. Um, that just, in this case, that's just mass conservation. Okay? So imagine that rather than doing this experiment, just imagine now, just to make the <coughs> algebra uh, simpler, we know the, let's say, the Vincenzo experiment, which would be looking at the response, okay, to a step function, okay? So, sorry, that's, okay. If, you, if we do this, we would end up with a, a field which would have a form a sharp uh, front, and the question is, what is the speed of this shock? Okay, this sharp fr front of the, of the density. So, the only thing that you need is, is mass conservation because actually, actually that's the only thing that you have to describe the problem. So you say, okay, let's look at what's going on in this region. Let's say that's minus L, that's L. Let's say that's zero at a given time. And mass conservation tells you that's nasty. I'm going to ask you a question like this uh, <laughs> for this talk. So let's try to do it properly. It, mass conservation tells you that the integral the, of uh, dt5 over space has to be zero. Huh? Okay, we do not, the droplets are not radioactive, right? <coughs> and this, basically, if you use the Burgos equation, is just the integral minus L plus L of uh, phi dx okay, of one half dx phi square dx, okay, which is x of this is equal to this, and you can perform the integral, so that's phi, let's say, squared uh, right minus phi squared left, left and this is phi right, okay? So the variation of the mass in the given window that I'm looking at is given <coughs> by the difference of the square of the fraction here and the square of the fraction there, good? But I can also, I also I know that I'm looking for um, yeah, the speed of a, of a wave. Okay, so if that's a wave, and if I'm looking at the system, um, okay, the frame moving uh, at the velocity of the shock, I can actually. So let's say that let's write it like this, dt. Okay, so this is a mass, and this mass, actually, the variation of the mass, I can write it like this. That's the integral between minus L and this point, which is moving at, which is at the position CT, if C is the velocity that I'm looking for, of, 
phi dx plus integral ct l phi dx, right? So this is the variation of the map. This has to be equal to that. I've just, you know, extracted the dt from the integral. And this, as in this setup, phi is a constant of a space in this interval and this interval, this is just c times, uh, pop, 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 pop. Uh, let's do it properly. Should be c right minus phi, uh, plus phi left. Okay, so here that's phi. Phi equal is a constant in this phi right, and here that's phi left. Okay, good. So now, if I just notice that this is equal to that, what I find is c is the ratio phi r squared minus phi l squared over the sum, which is exactly here equal because I've taken the velocity of a particle to be one, will be discontinuity, the local discontinuity. Okay, so the shock velocity is exactly given here in this unit <coughs> by the discontinuity of the local fra of the fraction. Okay, so now that I've done that, I can that's a huge victory for me. Okay. I'm a professor, I do not teach, and I made the calculation right on the blackboard, but okay, we can. Is it, yeah. It's gonna be online, so that's wonderful. I, I can show that to my students now. Uh, so the thing is, I could do even better, because here I've, uh, I've uh, talked only about the Burgers equation, but now I can say, okay, the uh, current is not given by the square of phi, but it's, let's say that it's given by any function of phi, and I can just reproduce exactly the same reasoning, rather than having a square quantity, I can just put, put here f of phi right minus f of phi left, and it would work uh, also pretty well. Okay, good. And, oh, by the way, this is not the uh, uh, Bartolo relation, unfortunately, that's uh, the so-called Rankine um, Huguenot, Rankine Huguenot uh, criterion to determine the speed of a shock. Okay. <laughs> what's up? The one half. Uh, what happened to the one half? That's a good question. Okay, could you sh switch off the camera for a second, please? <laughs> ah, no, that's from the. Uh -huh. Okay, yes, let's do this like this. Excellent idea, you know. <laughs> okay, and okay, let's be consistent like this, this, and this. No, no, of course not. That's all true. Because at the end, you do scaling in France, but at the end, you have the correct result, right? <laughs> uh, so let, oh, let me see more seriously. I think it's just a matter of the definition of, uh, of the Burgers equation. So here, if I say that, uh, phi dx, so that's consistent. So to tell you the truth, I've not defined the velocity unit. Yeah. So. Huh? No. Here? No, no, I think that you want this one. You think so? Okay, if you say so, okay. No, no, but seriously, no, I think that here, here, if I just stick to this, uh, 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 these units that I've used, you don't have the factor of two, that's just a discontinuity. Okay, this, okay, I'm sure about this calculation. Can I just try to change this topic? Sure. Um, I've noticed that the profile is somewhat smooth. That's Why right. Is that the diffusive term that's arising from the fact that... Oh, uh, no, so first, so... Pro no, of course. No, I've got to tell you, I, I don't know, because also I've got to tell you that this, those are actual experimental data, and the droplets are not exactly monodispersed. Okay, so the small one have a velocity that's, okay. So I don't know whether that's an effective diffusivity of this result just for the, for the dispersed. 
Okay, so good. We have shock waves, and uh, now we all know why the velocity of the shock is given by the discontinuity of the, of the local uh, field. Good. The problem is that I've not answered the question I've asked in the first place, right? The question why it was why is uh, the one D uh, stream of particle unstable, and it's not. Okay, I spent quite a lot of time to um, explain a phenomenon that does not answer the initial question at all. Okay. So in terms of teaching, that's very bad. So let's come back to the initial question. Why is the 1D, are the 1D traffic flows unstable? So before telling you why they're unstable, let me try to answer uh, Vincenzo's question and show you how the system gets destabilized. So in this experiment, let me stop a little bit. We started with an experiment at the current which is slightly below the invasion current. And in the course of the movie, the current has been increased okay, by a tiny, minute amount above the critical uh, current value. And what you can, and let me play it, let's say. Yeah, yeah, okay. Here we are below J stars, then boom, we increase, slightly increase the current. And as you can see here, even though there is a lot of empty space, traffic jam forms right, at the entrance. And the droplets are not that silly. They, they basically behave as you would do on the road. If you are behind a slow mover, what you do is you try to pass him, right? And that's what we are going to do. Let me speed up the movie a bit. And they start invading the network. OK. So in fact, the thing is, you don't even have to refer to an instability mechanism. The thing is, you don't even have a steady state. And this, you can readily, readily see this from the, where is the pointer? It's here. From the relation between the current and the density. So far, I've talked only about the, de the relation between the velocity of the particle and the local density. But if I now look at the relation between the current and the density, that's a quadratic function, okay? With a negative uh, curvature. So basically, J of phi is something like that. And what we do in the experiment is that we try to impose the current value. So here, that's okay. Here, that's okay. We can find steadily moving uh, crystals. But when you try to impose a current with, which is higher than this maximum value, you don't, have a, you don't even have a stationary solution. And this is exactly what's happening in the, in the system. Basically, what we are trying to do is to inject droplets with a time period which is shorter than the time that it takes for droplets to move o over uh, its own diameter. So obviously, it's going to induce a jam at some point. Okay, and that's what we saw in the movie. And this, if I come back to, if I just rotate this graph, 90 degrees, that's exactly what we have. That's the density of the random current, and we have a maximum value. Above this value, we don't have any stationary solution. We have collisions, and the collisions trigger the invasion of the network. Good. So that's fine. So now, if I look at actual traffic jams, if I look at actual measurements of the current of cars on highways as a function of the uh, density along the highway, oh, and those experiments have, have been done in pedestrian in a kind of a funky manner, but let's say that the pedestrian flux plotted as a function of the linear uh, stacking fraction. Yeah. Absolutely not. Some bytes are exist. At the moment, that's purely phenomenological. But what we know is that the network invasion, the jam formation, is not a result of any instability, of any amplification mechanism. It's just that we know that the system does not have a steady state 
to a given range of control parameters. Okay? And th these graphs uh, actually have been explained in the first place by the Burgers equation, which is the zero of order model for actual traffic jams. And all the other ones are uh, right, uh, let's say elaboration around burgers like models taking into account the finite response time of the driver, taking into account the stress, or I don't know. Good. So to go back to your question, the question precisely now is why do you have this decrease? Why does the velocity of a particle decreases as you increase the local fraction? Okay, we have to answer this question. And for this, we have to uh, do some theory. Okay. How much time do we have? Uh, 25 minutes. 25 minutes? Okay. 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 Including questions? Okay. Good. Uh, so let's try to figure out what is, uh, the re uh, uh, what is the form of the dynamic interaction and why they are reducing the speed uh, of the dense uh, stream. So this is basically the setup that we want to model. Okay, so let's make it simpler. Let's forget about the specific shape of the posts. Let's say, okay, we just have a homogeneous channel networks with particles uh, in it. Good. Now, okay, let's even forget about the particles. I just have a fluidic network. Okay. How can I what describe the flow of the fluid inside this network? So that's super simple. Uh, so that's hydrodynamics for physicists. That's basically the law that dictates the flows inside networks are the Kirchhoff flows, identical to the one that you have in electricity. It just tells you that if you have a vertex, the sum of all the currents is zero, just because the fluid that we are using are not compressible. And the second law, which is this one, is a Darcy law that just tells you that if you get pipe and if you apply a pressure difference across the pipe, then the velocity of the fluid average over the cross section okay, is proportional to the pressure drop. Okay, it's just like the voltage, the difference is proportional to the current intensity okay, in, in a conductor. And J, uh, no, G, sorry, here is the conductance, the hydrodynamic conductance. Good. <coughs> so, okay. And you don't really want to deal with all the IJs index in, uh, indices. So let's make it uh, like a continuous media. Let's, okay, use a smaller magnification. With a, let's not use a microscope, but just let's look at with our eyes at the system. So this is a continuous version of the equations. So the first one is just the uh, incompressibility condition, the divergence of the loss is zero, and this is a Darcy law, okay? Rather than referring to a pressure jump, we just here you know, redefine uh, the conductance and refer to a pressure gradient. Good. So now I have to tell you uh, what's happening when a particle is uh, in a pipe, and I already told you that, when you add the droplet locally, the droplet reduces the conductance of the pipe it flows in. So you can say it with delta functions, but basically this is what this formula says, that when you have a droplet at this position, okay, it reduces the conductivity by a given amount. Okay. Good. So you have equations for the transport of the fluid, you this equation describes the coupling between the droplet positions and the flu uh, fluid velocity. Now we have to choose a, a rule to explain the droplet dynamics. Okay. And this one, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm just saying that the droplet moves at a velocity which is proportional to the fluid velocity around it. Okay. That's a simple and that that you can make. Uh, I would say that's just dimensional analysis at this point. Good. So we have to solve this set of equations, okay. And now I'm sure that all the experimentalists, especially the PhD students, are extremely scared. 
But the thing is that you probably don't know that, but you have all, all of you have already solved 90% of the problem. So I don't even have to do anything. So this, okay, let's do this. I take this equation, the velocity is proportional to the pressure gradient, and I take the divergence of it, okay? So this is it, the divergence of the pressure gradient multiplied by the local time distance is zero. So this is a partial differential equation. I need to specify some boundary conditions. The con boundary condition is just that far away from the region I'm looking at, the velocity is a constant. Good. So this, pro so what is it? You know, you know this, this set of these equations, right? Beer, who wants a beer? <laughs> Two beers. Do you want a beer or William from Nando? Beer. beer, okay, that's a beer. <laughs> <laughs> you can change your mind, but you can tell me later. Okay. Indeed, that's electrostatics. Okay. So the pressure plays uh, the role of the uh, electric potential. I should not have used five there, but anyway. Uh, the local conductance is a dielectric constant, and the velocity is just the electric field. Okay, so now, in, ter in terms of electrostatics, adding a droplet, what does it, this mean? Beer, William, phone number, Vincenzo's phone number. Oh, no, my phone number. Ah, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't. My star, the elevation that does not affect the star. That's right. Okay, let's forget, forget about the map, okay? So I'm adding a droplet at some point in space, okay? If I just want to translate it in the electrostatic language, what does this mean? I'm not asking you how you would solve the problem. Okay? I'm just asking you what is the problem. So let, let me show you this slide. Adding a droplet is changing locally this quantity. If, if a droplet is here, I change G somewhere else. Which means that in terms of electrostatics, having a droplet is just like having a defect in the material which locally changes the dielectric constant. Okay? Let's say the material is vacuum, and locally I put uh, an insulating particle, <coughs> point one. In addition, I've got an electric field, okay, away from the particle, which is uniform. I think you have all already solved this problem. If you put an insulating particle in a field, the particle gets polarized, and the far field is a dipole of, uh, 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 electric field. So that's exactly the same. Here, you've got the charged dipole that results uh, from the modification of the uh, dielectric constant. Here, we just have a a source uh, dipole, meaning that in terms of fluid dynamics, it's just like adding uh, a tap and a, and, a, and a sink, okay, located almost at the same position, okay, that induces a flow which would be similar to the one resulting from the addition of a, of a, of a droplet, okay. And these are the flow lines, and you know that uh, in 2D, the electric field decays at 1 over r squared, and that's exactly the same thing for the velocity, free velocity field. So let me go faster. Ah, let me show you that indeed we have a dipolar perturbation. Okay? So look, look at those droplets. Okay? As they move, okay, let's try to, let's try to do this with, uh, does this work? Actually, it's, it works better when you see better when it's moving. When this particle moves, it induces a dipolar flow field around it, meaning that it pushes the fluid upwards, okay, behind it. And that's what you see. You see here, pop, 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 all the droplets are pushed upwards, okay? And you can also see that those droplets are moving faster than those ones. And all of the central droplets induce a dipolar flow field, meaning that 
the, the velocity of the fluid here is higher than the velocity of the fluid there. That's why those ones are moving faster. They are basically pushed by the central block. And this analysis is correct. Uh -huh. This is agreement. There's huh? no question that the difference in velocity. Absolutely. You yeah, yeah. You can actually, this works pretty well, right? That's OK. So you can solve all those equations. You, you, you open your favorite electrodynamic, uh, electrostatic uh, textbook. You pick the exact formula for the dipole. You solve the equation of motion for the particle, which is the velocity of the particle. Is the velocity is just the advection velocity uh, induced by the uh, uh, applied external uh, field plus the sum of the dipole or disturbances. Do the math, and even you can also take into account the images if you get a, 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 a narrow channel. You don't really have to worry about the images if the channel is wide enough. You do all this, and at the end, what you see, what you can predict is that if you get a crystal of droplets, you predict that the droplet velocity varies like that as a function of the droplet density. If you achieve that you get a continuous medium, which would be consistent with all our hypothesis, you can show that's actually a linear dependence. Honestly, given the quality of our measurements, which was pretty bad at that time, let's confess, you cannot really distinguish between the two. So it's just a linear uh, approximation is really just as good as you can get. Here, the only important thing, thing to, to remember is that as a droplet moves, okay, it induces flow disturbance. And obviously, here, this one is slowed down both by the droplets in front of it and by the droplet, uh, droplet behind it. Okay. <coughs> Good. Excellent. Uh, so clearly, we show that confinement of particles results in uh, uh, hydrodynamic interactions. Those interactions are responsible for the invasion of the network. They are also responsible for this uh, shockwave propagation. Can also let me just tell you, I haven't, sh haven't shown you the uh, data, but it accounts also very well for uh, intermittent dynamics uh, in the invaded regime. Uh, and I wanted to show you something about droplets uh, trafficking in uh, geometries which are even simpler in geometries where we would have removed all the costs. But I think I should stop now, do you think? Or should be no? Okay. So let's stop now. Okay, so thank you for your attention. It would not change really much the script and it would be like looking at the provided that your network is homogeneous at the scale you want to describe it. Okay. At leaning order, you would always have a dipole orbit, a dipole in the far field. What is more complex to understand is what happens if the heterogeneities of the network are the scale at which you are trying to probe it. Then you have disorder or matters and this is a completely different story than what we are currently trying to figure out what's going on in this situation. No, you, you won't want the contest, given the, the criterion. <laughs> okay. That's an excellent question. So obviously, Manhattan is not appropriate. Okay. <laughs> um, no, is that another question? Or that I so is that related? Just tell me. Makes a difference. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. So this, I can readily tell you that for hydrodynamics, it's going to be completely different because the interactions between here in this setup, we don't have inertia here. Okay. We looked at curved channel, but we didn't look at this type of uh, quantities. So in we, I'm pretty sure that, okay, look, in within this framework, the shape of the channel is completely irrelevant. The additional hydrodynamic resistance, except if the curvature radius compare with the actual size of the particle. But whatever the shape of the channel, the Darcy law applies. The pressure drop is proportional to the uh, velocity, okay, to the flow rate. And adding a droplet just increases the resistance by a given amount, okay? And, and this is independent of the curvature, except if the radius of curvature is comparable to the particle size, okay? But coming back to your question, uh, I would say that definitely if you have an, an homogeneous network, okay, at the scale you are trying to prevent the jam to occur, this cannot, you cannot find any possible geometry to circumvent the traffic jams. I think that you you could have is to, to you could try it is to add long bypasses. Long bypasses and this I don't know how to describe it theoretically. I don't know either, but that's definitely the di the reverse engineering problem is definitely more challenging, but also much more interesting. Definitely. I don't know. I don't know, but if you have a pipe network, okay, you still have Darcy law. Plus, uh -huh. okay, yeah. absolutely. Exactly, exactly. But in 3D, all, the, the point is all what, uh, that I've been discussing today results from confinement. You need confinement, you need momentum to be absorbed. Otherwise, that's a completely different story. Okay.